All right, guys, the first time I recorded this, it took 46 minutes, and I also did not turn the audio capture on. So, we're going to try this again. This is the case for Rick Santorum. Uh, there are going to be seven points we're going to go through, and we're also going to go through some uh, pictures. I'll put some pictures into this video. Lots of sources, all in the description. Okay. So today is March 20th, 21st. I apologize. Well, now that it's after midnight, it's the 21st, but the data I'm telling you about occurred on the 20th yesterday, I suppose it is. Illinois primary. 99% of precincts reporting, um, Mitt Romney wins 47% of the vote, Santorum 35, Ron Paul 9, Newt Gingrich 8. Now this is important because it continues a trend that's been set since Super Tuesday, and that is that the conservative candidates altogether win, but Mitt Romney beats any particular conservative candidate. So this is, this is the theory that I'm putting forth, that if the conservative candidates consolidate, they will beat Mitt Romney. And I also am asserting that Rick Santorum is the best person to consolidate them. Why? Well, um, basically because he's a moderate conservative. Now a lot of people will dispute that and say he's not a conservative at all. So let's go to some data. This is Powerline, the Powerline blog, and the Powerline blog is referencing American Conservative Union's uh, ratings archive for 2006. It should be noted that since 2006, uh, Ron Paul has remained conservative, and Rick Santorum has become more conservative since 2006 uh, because he's trying to appeal to his conservative base. So uh, according to the archives for 2006, Santorum's lifetime average was 88.1, and this is on a scale from 0 to 100, 100 being the ideal conservative according to American Conservative Union. 88, a score of 88.1 according to the data means that 20 Republicans at that time had voting records which were more liberal than him, and 26 had voting records which were more conservative than him. Uh, so he's roughly moderate there. Bring it forward to today. I would say he's perfectly moderate. I'd say it's probably 23-23 today. Uh, and of course, it's not that he's perfectly moderately conservative in every aspect. He is in the aggregate, but the fact of the matter is he's very conservative socially and not very conservative economically. In the blog, it mentions this, and I agree with this says the explanation for these numbers is evident. While Santorum was reliably conservative on social issues, he was not conservative on economic and fiscal issues. Uh, Santorum is well known to be a compromiser, a pork and barrel politician, bought and sold, uh, makes tons of deals, and uh, he is a compromiser. Now some people say the compromise thing is bad. We'll get into that later. It's actually a bittersweet thing. It has good and bad in it. Um, so let's go to this economic issue now that we're talking about how he's socially conservative, economically not conservative. Some people who are fans of Santorum might think that he is economically conservative. Well, you're wrong. Uh, for the record, my opinion on Santorum and my opinion on Paul, neither of them has changed. I like Paul more than ever, and I still think uh, um, Santorum is a mediocre guy. But uh, from a realistic perspective, uh, my paradigm has shifted, and I think it's realistic that Santorum can win, not that Paul can win. And we'll get into my final point, which is some expectations um, theory, which is uh, very important. And so basically, the values that I believe, I expect, will be uh, better enacted if Rick Santorum is elected. We'll get into that later. 
Economic issues. Okay, so Santorum is uh, fairly economically ignorant, and uh, he has four subsidies against the gold standard, against ending the Fed. Um, he appreciates mainstream Keynesian and Chicago and or neoclassical economics, if you're familiar with any of that. Uh, Ron Paul, of course, uh, appreciates Austrian economics, um, no subsidies, all this. In, a world, in an ideal world, there would be a flat tax, uh, there would be a gold standard, no Fed, things like this, uh, laissez-faire. And uh, so that kind of shows you that uh, Ron Paul is much more economically, con economically conservative. There's also the philosophical versus the practical issue. I touched on this a little bit. Uh, this is whether or not to compromise. So Ron Paul takes the philosophical high ground and says, I'm not going to compromise. They call him Dr. No. He votes no on everything not explicitly granted power by the Constitution. Um, at least at the federal level, he does that. <laughs> and uh, Santorum uh, takes a less philosophical high ground and more excuse me, I take up practical stance, and he's, uh, like I said, bought and sold, uh, compromises all the time, and he does this, as he said, uh, basically to get his major bills through, he'll compromise on some minor stuff. And so Ron, and now we're citing the Cincinnati uh, Inquirer, um, I think I told somebody this was the Mississippi, it's actually Missouri, so whatever. No, it's not. Oh, dang, wherever Cincinnati is. Is that Ohio? Whatever. Okay, so, Inquirer fact check St. Orm and Planned Parenthood. Uh, Ron Paul's campaign has now released two attack ads on St. Orm, calling, saying that he hooked Planned Parenthood up with a few million bucks, and they're accusing him of being a hypocrite because he is socially conservative, pro-life, and yet funds abortion. Uh, and calls him a fake conservative. Okay, so, um, St. Orm explains during the debate that funding was part of a large bill that he had to vote up or down on and he approved of the majority of the bill and the Planned Parenthood was pork and he uh, went he went for it. Uh, he later uh, said he actually wants to defund Planned Parenthood called abortion and inhumanity. And I selected this article because this is very typical of Santorum. This is what he does all the time. There's tons of large bills that has tons of pork on it. Of course this happens all over Washington. And uh, he will vote for a bill that has some pork, and, the, and basically pork is free riders or things that they throw on there uh, to get the other side to vote for it. Um, and so he buys into it a lot more often than Ron Paul does. Actually, Ron Paul virtually never buys into pork. And uh, so, so that's kind of the, the, the justification there. It's the philosophical versus the practical. Santorum says... I voted for it not because I'm a hypocrite, not because you know I'm ignorant, not because any of these things. He said I voted for it for a practical matter. You know I gave him that concession to pass the bill, and this is very typical of his attitude, which is contrasted with Ron Paul's attitude, which is sort of a all or nothing attitude. Either you do it right or you don't do it at all, which is quite respectable. In fact, I prefer that attitude, but it's but it's like I said, not practical. At this point, there was a point at the start of the primary process where I thought it was possible it might work, but it didn't fly. Uh, and that's because no person in modern history has uh, done so poorly today. He's only won the Virgin Islands. And no person in modern history has done so poorly today through Super Tuesday and everything and secured even the candidacy of their party, let alone the election. Uh, the presidential election. As far as I'm aware, correct me if I'm wrong, but I researched it and that's, you know, I couldn't find any data on anybody who had ever done that. Anyway, so that's the philosophical issue. Let's move on to social issues. Two parts of the social issues. Uh, we'll talk about uh, life, war, and porn. So pro-life or pro-choice, if you want to call it that, whatever, that's classically a social issue. And the uh, conservative stance is classically pro-life. Now, why is this the conservative stance? Well, basically, there's different forms of conservatism. We do need to break that down, and people don't talk about this. There's fiscal conservatism, social conservatism, and traditionalist conservatism. 
contrasted with uh, fiscal and social liberalism as well as uh, progressivism is contrasted with um, traditionalism, which is also gradualism. Um, so the pro-life thing would be uh, a little bit of traditionalism, and it would also be a lot of social conservatism, and social conservatism can further be broken down into uh, what's basically religious conservatism and secular humanism secular conservative humanism, because there is a liberal br branch of secular humanism. Um, but something like 92% of social conservatives are self-identified as religious conservatives. So basically this is Christians uh, who are saying that uh, we don't believe in abortion, we're pro-life, and we define life this way. So that's why, it's a so that's why it's socially conservative. And you'll hear people talk about social conservatives, mostly they're talking about religious conservatives, and amongst the religious conservatives, mostly they're talking about Christians. Um, so, uh, this is, the pro-life is important for a couple reasons. It actually shows a point in which Ron Paul is hypocritical, and this is a rare point, and it's because in a pure libertarian society, he would be pro-choice, but he's pro-life. Why is he pro-life? Uh, really, he's pro-life because he's a Christian, but he won't admit that, and he has a lot of secular fans, so he doesn't want to say that. Uh, what he likes to say is that there's an intrinsic value in the human life. So this is actually the secular conservative humanist uh, approach. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is if you look at how he developed that ideology, it's because he was raised Christian, became a doctor, delivered a lot of babies, and that's just how he felt. Which, this is rather hypocritical because it goes against is purely libertarian ideology, which would say, let people do what they want. So this is a stance where Ron Paul is hypocritical, and it shows a stance where Rick Santorum is uh, very consistent, with the exception of the article I cited before because of uh, pork barrel compromises. But if you look at his record, it follows the 88.1% by the ACU pretty well. The 88% of the time, he's for life, and 12% he'll vote against it for some pork barrel compromise reason. Um, war, we'll get to that specifically, it's a special one, it's kind of its own deal. And uh, here's the point thing. So Rick St. Thomas making a big deal about this and Ron Paul is not making a big deal about it. Reason for that is that Ron Paul is kind of, you know, free market, let people do what they want, make their own decisions, and he doesn't want to regulate it, doesn't want to increase government rule, laws, taxes, anything like that. So he is saying let the porn industry do its thing. Well, Rick Santorum is saying it's bad for society. It's bad for values, bad for culture. We need to regulate it, kill it. And this is a good uh, point of contrast because it contrasts liberty and freedom, which Ron Paul represents, with righteousness or goodness, which Santorum claims to represent. And in this case, I agree with him. In certain cases, I don't. But in this case, I agree with him. Uh, and so, um, this basically is a fundamental issue of democracy versus republicanism. In a democracy, everyone has an equal vote, they do what they want, and the cream sort of rises. It's very free market. In a pure republican system, you don't hear about this, but if you go read The Republic by Plato, you will understand that a republican system is openly biased toward the elite. So the elite run things in a republic. Uh, it's really an oligarchy, however, the mechanism of becoming an oligarch is different from a, say, for example, a feudal oligarchy where it's a birthright or something like that. In Plato's Republic, you earn your um, oligarchship, if that's what you want to call it. And he would say things like, well, you need to be educated, you need to uh, be wise and of a gold soul. He would say things like this. Uh, and in our modern day equivalent, this would be things like literacy tests, high education, and Plato would only let these people vote. So he would bias the market in favor of the elite, and I believe this is superior because, first of all, history bears it out. Um, when less ignorant people were voting, the economy was more vibrant. And I won't get into, there's a lot of debate going on there, but... Uh, furthermore, I'd like to point out, and this is an example of a biased economy producing superiority, that if you look at all of the successful nations of the really the whole planet right now, they owe it essentially to the Judeo-Christian tradition. Western Europe, Canada, 
United States, New Zealand, Australia, are all directly impacted by Christianity. Um, and even China and Japan uh, are indirectly because they are they owe their success to the capitalistic uh, concepts and really just copying America. And these capitalistic free market concepts came from the idea of free will, which came from the idea of Christianity. Secular humanists, seculars in general, have a generally predeterministic view of life. Uh, it can be materialistic, um, things like this. Some, you know, I don't mean to say all of them, I'm saying a lot of them. Some of them do believe in an afterlife and things like that, but the point being that by and large, the secular uh, scientist, naturalist philosophy is one of predetermination, and they have no reason to believe in a free will, so why should they believe in a free market? They wouldn't, uh, naturally speaking. The reason a lot of scientists and things like that believe in a free market is because history has bared it out that free markets are superior, but if you trace the origin of the free market, it traces back to Judeo-Christian stances on the idea of free will and that people do in fact have a free will. Alright, so that's that little plug on how values can bias a market to be superior than a pure open market. Other examples would include the fact that um, you know, people say things like this, that the porn industry will ruin our economy. Things like the Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians and the Abbasid Empire, all before their fall, recognize themselves as superior which America is doing nowadays. Anybody heard of American exceptionalism? And this is the Greek concept of hubris, that excessive pride will kill a country. And there are also theories that homosexuality and things like this can ruin uh, countries. I won't assert that, but it's another example of what people talk about. And there is some precedent for it that children raised with no dad or children raised with no mom have a tendency to psychological destabilization, destabilization. Anyway, so we'll carry on. Let's talk about war. All right. A couple interesting things here. So St. is very hawkish, pro-war, wants to kill the Muslims, all that. Uh, Ron Paul wants to get out of there, and his argument is the economic argument. And I'll prove to you that these arguments are, in fact, neutral and equivalent. And that's because if you're familiar with economics and political science, you'll know that politics is economics and economics is politics. The political system is determined through a political mechanism called voting, things like this. Uh, you know, every system is a little bit unique in how they represent. But the fact of the matter is you can buy votes. And political votes and systems are correlated with economic concepts. <coughs> and furthermore, in addition to the economics determining the votes, actually the result of the political system can determine the economy. So economic policy can determine the economic efficiency of a country monopoly powers, things like this. Um, so they're, they're really uh, interconnected in a, at an intrinsic level to the, to, the, to the fact that every action you do, whether you shop at HEB or Walmart, is also a political action. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that the long-run interest for the economy, which, as I just proved, is equivalent to the long-run interest for the political system is not always the short run interest. And actually the political system is determined by an aggregation of the cultural values in that economy. Go see my video, Nature as a Worldview Filter, and I demonstrate that values in a culture are determined in a market-like structure. Um, basically an example of this would be Congress compromising, as epitomized by Rick Santorum. When they compromise, the extremes uh, reach an equilibrium, and it's a value, social value equilibrium. So let's say they, that Congress uh, compromises that they'll define the point of life at starting at the third trimester, or second trimester, right? So it's not the extreme of point of conception, it's not the extreme of point of birth, it's the second trimester. Well, this is a compromise of values, and things like that happen all the time. Okay. So the point there being that values determine politics and economics because politics and economics are equivalent. 
So a value argument is equivalent to an economic argument in the long run. Um, so there's a little proof of neither one of them uh, should be outweighed. If you're a person who weights the economy more than your values, or weights your values more than the economy, that is a false dichotomy. You shouldn't be doing that. They should be equivalent. The question is, which is more realistic? And now we get into a sophisticated question of, is Iran going to have a nuke? Are they going to declare war? Um, and the objective fact of the matter, if you're familiar with Islam, is yes, they will declare war. It's a matter of time. Ron Paul supporters tend to be socially liberal, and they like to say, Iran's not going to use a bomb. They're not going to attack. They wouldn't dare. But if you read the Quran, they are more than happy to go kill themselves. It, you know, they'll kill a hundred of themselves if it ends up in one of you dying. So they don't care if it's not realistic to win the war. They will still declare the war. And so Santorum's policy of wanting to have this war to take care of the Muslim problem to preserve our society is legitimate. And uh, so is Ron Paul's economic argument is obviously legitimate. But the fact that they're both legitimate and that the, neither one should be preferably weighed shows that they are equivalent and they are a wash. So the war is not a big issue like everyone says it is. Um, I mean, it's obviously a big issue, but in terms of a deciding factor, it shouldn't sway you either way. Although it has large impl implications for what's going to happen in the future, um, morally, you should be neutral on the subject. And that's because if our country is socialized or Islamized, and perverse in that way, it will ultimately lead to economic deterioration anyway. So let's say we pull out of the Middle East, and the Middle East grows and invades us and takes us over, whether through a armed war or through a not armed war, and they just grow and infect our political system and get Sharia law in the U.S. like they're doing in the U.K. right now. Uh, it holds economic implications as well as political as well as value implications either way. Alright, so let's get to the money issue. Um, I'll show you all some pictures. We got real clear politics showing uh, that basically Santorum has a lot more money than Ron Paul and that Santorum's money is on the rise where Ron Paul's is on the decline. Contrary to popular belief, Ron Paul cannot continue to tap his base. I actually gave Ron, money to Ron Paul, uh, so if you think that you're this big bad Ron Paul guy and you're you know, more supportive of him than me and I'm a fake Ron Paul guy and I never was a Ron Paul fan, check yourself before you wreck yourself because I probably gave more money to him than you did. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that, and you can see Blue Cross Blue Shield, Comcast Corporation, and investors are all giving money to St. Torm, so you can see his influence, insurance companies, things like that. His vice is very open. This is OpenSecrets.org, very reputable website. And Ron Paul doesn't even have five top contributors. He has four because he only has four contributors. And in total, they amount to something like $2,500. And the rest of his money is small, small-time, person-to-person checks. Anyway, uh, but actually, Santorum getting all this money is good for him because money is the mother's milk of politics. And this brings us to theblaze.com, where we find out that Romney outspent Santorum 21 to 1 in the Chicago media market. And uh, so, 21 to 1. And it resulted in 47% to 35%. So his marginal ability, Romney's marginal ability to use money is very terrible. And Santorum's marginal ability to use mar money is very good. In addition, St. Torm actually has some substantial, a few million dollars, and increasing, whereas Ron Paul has less than, I believe, less than half a million dollars in decreasing. So he's going broke. And as, as much as y'all like to, you know, believe in the American guy, that he can just overcome the news and just vote correctly, that's not true. People are ignorant. And this is just a reality check. Um... Yeah, so a 21 to 1 fiscal thing in Romney's favor, and he doesn't even double, he doesn't even get one and a half times Santorum's vote. So this is more evidence to the fact that Romney uh, uh, is really hitting some barriers and can easily be overcome if the conservative base will consolidate. Remember, that's the theory we're going with. Conservative base will consolidate behind Santorum and beat Romney. That's the theory that I'm asserting here.
I've pretty much touched on all my articles. Um, a couple other things you might like to note is that before the Illinois that happened yesterday, before that, uh, Paul was up to 66 delegates, Santorum 247, and Romney 554. <clears throat> this is another practical issue of can Ron Paul get the delegates? And the answer is no. He can get enough delegates to influence the platform. I'll touch on that in a minute. But he's not going to win. Uh, if any foreseeable trend continues, and there's also trend data on the polls I'll show. Maybe I'm, when I edit the video, maybe I'm showing that picture right now. I'm not sure. And you can see that Paul has coasted 11%. When Perry dropped out, he went up a little bit. I predicted that in one of my other videos because uh, some of Rick Perry's supporters were very pro-states rights and Tea Party-ish. Um, but after Paul kind of grew from the Tea Party wave that left Rick Perry, he hasn't really grown much since. Santorum has continued to rise, and in light of Santorum rising, Romney has dropped, and you can see that picture here. Gingrich has, uh, you know, his average is higher than Paul, but that's because he spiked to be the leader and then dropped to be a nobody. Uh, presently, he's really consistent behind Paul. Paul's beating Gingrich consistently nowadays, but the poll average for the whole thing still rates Gingrich higher. And he does have more delegates, but I believe that will change in the near future. Um, so we talked about the money issue. Let's talk about the last issue, and this is the expectation uh, and damage control issue. And this is the final issue. Everything else had me to wash and still favoring Ron Paul. But this is the issue that changed my mind. Uh, in economics, we have expectations theory, and every good short-run model and a lot of good medium and long-run models of economics include expectation theory. You can go look at my video on foreign exchange where I demonstrate the fact that despite fundamental shifts, uh, people do what they want, basically. If everyone wants the euro relative to the dollar to go up, whether or not the fundamentals are in place, they will invest and cause the relative euro to the relative euro relative to the dollar, whatever I just said, they will cause that to go up. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, and it's a psychological, irrational, uh, non-objective, non- uh, economically predictable variable. And so uh, this expectations, um, when there is a fear of instability, expectations decrease and the economy will destabilize. A great example is the Great Depression. Uh, arguably the Great Recession we're in has some um, ability to attribute um, to the fact that people are not confident in the future. They believe there's some instability, so arguably it's leading businesses to bad short-term decisions, etc. Um, so this is this is the economic uh, thing. When, when they think there's going to be uh, insecurity, they'd rather hold on to their money, not invest it, the economy gets wrecked. But it's really not just economic, it's really societal. Uh, in political science, we also have an expectation theory which says that the government develops a role, role A, R-O-L-E, and it's got a little triangle thing over the E, uh, a hat, E hat, and it's a French word, role A, um, political theory, I forgot the theorist that came up with it, and uh, he says that the government develops a role in society, and if the government violates that role, in other words, it does something it's not expected to do, such as uh, a pacifistic society, the government declares war or a welfare state, the government, such as Greece, the government suddenly cuts welfare. It will create instability in that society because the people's um, expectations has been violated. And um, so this is the political science theory version. And uh, they really corroborate from different aspects. If you know that political science equals economics, uh, and politics is money, and money is politics, then you can realize that these are really talking about the same thing, and they're talking about uh, this kind of market. Um, when there is instability in the market, it results in a lower efficiency of that market. And so there is instability in voting for Ron Paul. Let me demonstrate this. A vote for Ron Paul increases Ron Paul's chance, but by virtue of uh, not supporting Santorum and by virtue of fractioning the conservative base, it also increases Romney's chance of winning. So a vote for Ron Paul 
increases the chance of Ron Paul winning, and it also increases the chance of Romney winning. Now, Romney is the liberal Republican, Ron Paul is the conservative Republican, Santorum is the moderate Republican. So, a vote for Ron Paul is an equivalent to a vote for the extremes. A vote for the extremes is destabilizing, and it will result in a, first of all, it will result in people just getting pissed off when they vote for Ron Paul and he doesn't win, or when they vote for Ron Paul and Romney wins, people just get pissed off. But it will also result in a destabilization of society, and perhaps that's equivalent to getting pissed off. Maybe it's unstable because you're pissed off. I don't know. But you can see from a theory standpoint how that's true, and that's verified by economic theory and political science theory. Uh, whereas a vote for Santorum would be a moderate vote, and the difference between a moderate of Santorum and a moderate of Gingrich is that while Santorum compromises and is a moderate, he is also intellectually honest and consistent, whereas Gingrich is a flip-flopper and intellectually dishonest and intellectually inconsistent. Um, so, in other words, you can't be confident in Gingrich anyway, so there's a destabilization even though he's a moderate. But there's not a destabilization in voting for Santorum, and that's because although he's a moderate, he's predictably moderate and he's stably moderate, uh, as verified by that 88.1%. You know, 88% of the time, he's going to be uh, conservative, and 12% of the time, not. And you can go get the data on Gingrich and contrast that. Suffice it to say, Gingrich is just a nut. Um, and this also goes to the idea of risk management. You know, insurance companies make tons of money off risk management, and the theory is that uh, it is better to make the safe bet than the risky bet. You know, a lot of Ron Paul supporters are called kamikaze uh, Ron Paulians, and they're so dedicated to Ron Paul that they shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, and this is a lot of political analysts talk about this. Uh, and they're like, well, I'll just wrote, I'll, I'll write Ron Paul in if he doesn't win, things like this. Well, this contributed to Obama's win in 2008. I don't know if you know that. Ron Paul got a ton of write-ins back then, and it fractured McCain's vote. Not that I like McCain much either, but I voted for McCain over Obama, and I went home and cried afterward. But you can see my point there, that uh, by fract fracturing the base, it causes this destabilization, which is theoretically bad and practically bad. It's both. So I think I, I, think I touched on everything there. Um, let me check my pictures real quick. Yeah, I touched on pretty much everything there. I'll sum, I'll sum it up real quick if I haven't summed it up already. So we need to solve this fracturing of the conservative base, and the best person to do that is Santorum. And if that happens, Santorum will overcome the liberal Republican. Don't be deceived in thinking that Romney is moderate or conservative. He is a liberal, and his policy is basically mirror Obama's. Um, so if we actually consolidate behind Santorum, the data shows that each and every time the conservative candidates get more votes than Romney gets, but the problem is they're fractured. So if we can take care of that fracturing, then uh, ever since Super Tuesday, the conservative candidate will have been winning. And obviously Santorum is in the optimal place to do this because he's already the leader amongst the others by a huge margin. As, uh, as shown in this Illinois um, example and tons of other examples. Go look them up. So, uh, you know, like this video, all that kind of stuff. Love to hear your thoughts, comments, all that. Um, I'll do it. Take care.